Oh, hi guys. It is another dreary, snowy day here in the end times. It is Friday, January 6th, 2020. So guys, uh, <laughs> I have been toying with the idea for years of <coughs> making an audio book out of the ebook that I wrote in the summer of 2009. I uh, wrote a book about my crazy adventures in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest. Uh, but I mean, it is a, it would be a monumental task for me to do this, but I, for the first time in 14 years, I am basically trapped uh, in a snowbank for 12 days. So uh, I'm going to play around with this and just see what kind of feedback I get from folks, both in terms of number of views and comments. So if you want me to keep doing this, I need to, uh, you need to tell me, okay? Uh, so anyway, the book I wrote in 2009 is published at lulu.com. That's L-U-L-U dot com. I think you can also find it on Barnes and Noble, at least at one time. You could also order the book at Barnes and Noble. I just ordered it from Lulu to make sure the link still works. It's five dollars. Just go on to lulu.com and you put in the title Peruvian Plunge and you can get the book yourself and read it yourself. So this book is exactly to the page 250 pages spread out over 28 chapters and the preface, which I'm getting ready to, to read uh, out loud. So uh, again, I don't know if I'm going to make it to the end. I am going to start by reading the preface, which is just kind of the backstory about how I got down to Peru in May of 2009. <coughs> you can skip all of this. Uh, if you don't need the backstory and go directly to chapter one and my next video, assuming there is a next video, or get the book yourself. But without further ado, I'm going to dive in to uh, Peruvian Plunge, the unfolding story of what happened when a realtor from Texas moved to the Peruvian Amazon to kick Big Oil's ass out of the Mother of God. Take it away. <clears throat> Do the preface. <clears throat> My maiden plunge into the jungles of the Peruvian Amazon officially commenced on May 22nd, 2009, exactly four months to the day before my 50th birthday. My journey had officially begun when I drove out of Austin, Texas on January 5th, 2009, but the seeds that would sprout into this long, strange trip were sown some three dozen years earlier when I was a 13-year-old, upper-middle-class suburban white kid in my native Atlanta, Georgia. Details of that unremarkable life-saving day are hazy now. I remember being alone in the basement, I believe on a Saturday morning, when I stumbled upon a Life magazine, which is strange enough in itself as my family did not subscribe to Life magazine, which did indeed affect my life for years to come. A photo in that issue from somewhere in the early 1970s, which someone actually tracked down for me a few years ago, showed an aerial view of the carpet of rich green canopy covering the distant and mysterious Amazon rainforest 
ripping, ripping diagonally across the lush, seemingly endless expanse of jungle was a straight, though ragged, red line. The line being a new highway that Brazil was ramming through the world's greatest unexplored wilderness to initiate a looting and plunder of the heart and lungs of Mother Nature, the likes of which this planet had never seen before. Emblazoned <clears throat> across the photo was the caption, Taming the Green Hell, the hell, of course, being the very heart of the most vibrant, fakin' set of biodiversity on the planet. The implication of the headline was that this taming was a good thing for this planet, or at least for those consumers in the U.S. who stood to benefit the most from this assault against Gaia. Of course, it would be years before I would be able to start untangling the unspeakable web of lies, deceit, arrogance, greed, and yes, flat-out evil that slithered and oozed behind this domestication of the last spot on Earth that needed taming. Staring at the macabre photo with the blood-red proclamation of life emblazoned across the magazine cover, I got this eerie, almost nauseous inkling of an idea that something was very wrong with this picture. It was some sort of intuitive shudder, the smallest whisper from spirit that the vandals had stormed the sacred, te sacred temple and that this planet would never be the same again. I have no clue what happened to that photo. Well, I actually did track it down a few years ago, but it has always been there, chafing at the back of my mind, pricking my conscience as I've moved through my life. On some level, that photo, every bit as jarring as if someone had sliced the face of the Mona Lisa <clears throat> from throat to forehead with a razor has haunted me and guided me. No doubt it had something to do with my decision to major in journalism, a choice which I hoped and believed in my idealistic youth would help me spread the word to the world that things were getting a wee bit unbalanced on this little blue planet. And for the first five years after finishing grad school, I held the dream and the focus when I was a writer and editor in the Santa Cruz, California area, specializing in environmental issues. <clears throat> but then something happened in 1988, right about the time I was fired from some local entertainment rag for which I was whoring for calling Spuds McKenzie the most, uh, the mascot of Budweiser beer, quote, the most putrid little pit bull in America. <clears throat> like so many of my friends and my own wife, I said, fuck poverty and sold out, big time. The very last published article I had, in fact, was about efforts by environmentalists in Central California to kick big oil out of Monterey Bay. Back in the unemployment line, I had two choices at that point in my life. Continue my crusading and my life of poverty by writing environmental news for penniless left-wing rags or take the advice of my brother, a successful real estate agent in Atlanta, to blow off this life of tilting at windmills and cash in on the largesse of Reaganomics by getting my California real estate license. Me, the raging, ranting, lefty, dirt-worshipping, tree-hugging, crusading journalist, sell out my values, for the almighty dollar, 
Somehow the very absurdity of the idea piqued my appreciation of the ironies in life. So I did. I got my real estate license and went to work for Century 21. Century 21. <laughs> and in the first three months of doing so, I made more money than I had made in the last 12 months as an environmental journalist. Hmm. It wasn't long before I had bought my first home. Despite the drain of a dying marriage, I managed to put the old nose to the grindstone and quickly became an up-and-coming young businessman in the San Lorenzo Valley of Santa Cruz County. There was even a time or two when I was deepest in denial that I rationalized purchasing redwood lumber over the howls of derision from tree-hugging former friends. But through it all, that photo of the green hell picked at my conscience. I answered it by buying an acre of rainforest in Belize to lock up from the planet eaters as a housewarming present for my buyers each time I sold a home in the redwood forest that had been 95% destroyed over the past century. <clears throat> Spirit knocked me upside the head with a 2 by 4 on October 7, 1989 at 5.04 p.m. when a 7.1 magnitude earthquake knocked Santa Cruz on its ass killing 67 people and emptying my wallet of $17,000, about $1,000 per second I lost that day. That little whisper from the universe about the error of my ways at least kept me off the real estate treadmill for a couple of years, 1990 and 1991, while I filled my time getting a long overdue divorce, moving to the little town of Cottage Grove, Oregon, where I bought a run-down hovel on five acres of thorns that I christened Chateau Fiasco of Aikenback Acres, and taking my first visit to the rainforest, or what was left of it, in Costa Rica. In 1992, I had a second brush with the real estate agent life in Oregon, but Spirit killed that train wreck the day I actually found myself the listing agent for 750 acres of old-growth Douglas fir forest on the western slopes of the Cascades. The $3.7 million listing was a gift from my boss, who was, not so coincidentally, the National Association of Realtors' official voice of the timber industry in Washington, D.C. The 90s were a strange decade that I won't try to sum up here for fear you would have me committed to a mental institution. Somehow, in all the manage, and all the madness, I managed to get down to Costa Rica five times from November to April each year for the first half of the decade. I even managed to call myself a tour guide in the burgeoning ecotourism industry for a few winters and get a book published called Pura Vida, The Waterfalls and Hot Springs of Costa Rica. I literally wore a loincloth and bathed in creeks and boycotted beef and cooked over open fires every night like a wild savage for five winters in a row between summertime stints as failed realtor, failed novelist, failed organic farmer. Naturally, 
During these years, I heard the Amazon calling, but I refused to answer. And as embarrassing as this is for me to admit, I'll tell you why I refused to answer. Moving to the Amazon would mean that I would have to give up the single biggest addiction that has ever owned me in my life, my gas-sucking truck. I would give up my job, my money, my friends, my house, beef, seafood, a roof over my head, electricity, and plumbing, but I was going to be goddamned if I was going to give up those four wheels and that gas-guzzling, planet-eating engine <clears throat> that drove them. So, I did not and managed to completely lose track of the carnage that was going on in South America while I was screwing around for several years with space aliens and Carlos Castaneda. In the middle of all this lunacy, my mother died, leaving me a sizable chunk of change in late 1997 I took advantage of this windfall by buying three houses in Florida, one of which was a hurricane-ravaged abandoned shack on five acres of mosquito-infested swampland in Homosassa, Florida, which I picked up at a Bank of America foreclosure sale for 15 grand. I named the place Bare Butt Acres for self-evident reasons, and held out in the swamp for three years behind a locked gate at the end of a one-lane dirt road, reading the entire Carlos Castaneda series three times, cover to cover. In the fall of 2000, boredom began to set in, so I pulled up stakes in the swamp, put my clothes back on, and moved to the live music capital of the world, South Austin, Texas. With little active intention on my part, I completely reinvented myself in South Austin. I'm not sure how it happened. I think it had something to do with the fact that I started smoking weed for the first time in my life at age 42, but somehow I was magically transformed from the awkward, socially phobic hermit that I had been my entire life to become some sort of social butterfly on the South Austin scene a reincarnation more complete and transformative than any caterpillar to butterfly story Ma Nature could ever have come up with. I had over 300 people at my 45th birthday party. <clears throat> uh, by night, I was a weed-smoking, harmonica-honking hippie partying until 2 a.m., five nights a week. By day, I put on my little monkey suit and went to work as a piss hauler for the world's biggest drug testing company, Quest Diagnostics, for nine bucks an hour. <laughs> I actually pulled off, I actually pulled this off for almost five years, miraculously enough, years in which I became so involved in partying that I completely lost all touch with the horrors that were going on down in the Amazon jungle. I was fiddling or playing harmonica while Rome burned with the rest of them while, ra while riding around with my dirt-worshipping tree-hugger and save-the-planet, kill-yourself bumper stickers on my beloved gas-sucking truck. Things turned really weird, as all my friends will tell you, in 2005 when I sold my $15,000 shack in Florida for $95,000 
and bought <clears throat> not one, but two houses on the outskirts of Austin. Next thing, my hippie musician friends knew I had cut off my hair, shaved my beard, left my slacker job as a piss hauler, and taken a job at Austin's biggest real estate firm, Keller Williams. By my second year there, 2007, this old harmonica honking pot smoking party animal was raking in six figures a year, five times what I had been making two years earlier, and owned, in a space of two years, seven houses in and around Austin, Texas, when most of my friends could barely make their monthly rent. I had so totally lost my link to spirit in the summer of 2007 that I spent over five grand building a fucking frog pond and not one but two tree houses at Frog Hollow. In short, I was really a piece of work and my rapidly dwindling position on the South Austin social ladder showed it. Then, out of the blue, in November of 2007, my life took a turn toward high strangeness from which it has never recovered when my spirit guide flew, or should I say danced, into my life. A friend of mine, Red-Headed Trish, sent me a YouTube video of the single coolest bird on the planet, Snowball the Dancing Cockatoo. Snowball sucked me down into the YouTube labyrinth, a hole from which I have never climbed back out of until I at least that year, until I crossed the line into Mexico less than six months ago. I, I was writing this from Cusco, Peru in 2009 when I didn't have access to YouTube videos. Falling deeper and deeper down the YouTube spiral, I hid out at Frog Hollow for hours on end casting about in the ocean of videos for keepers. 90% I tossed out, of course, but a tiny few stayed in my boat. Graham Hancock, Rick Strassman, and the like. And then, sometime around Christmas of 2007, I landed my whopper, the late, great Terence McKenna, the wild-haired philosopher of the bazaar, and more importantly, guru of magic mushrooms. <clears throat> At, as all of my friends know, Terence McKenna convinced me to eat five grams of dried psilocybin magic mushrooms, which I did on the beach during the full moon of May 2008, during that eight-hour spaceship ride to another planet, I channeled the spirit of a murdered silverback gorilla who gave me his right-on-target summary of the dismal state of the blue planet. After he zipped off in a UFO, the mushroom god advised me, sensibly enough, to quit my job, sell my house to Terence McKenna's best friend, true story, and everything else I own, leave all of my friends, take a de facto vow of celibacy, and head to the Peruvian Amazon to kick Big Oil's ass out of the jungle. Since then, the mushroom god, well, this was in 2009, since then, the mushroom god has, has added gasoline engines, cell phones, beef, and Walmart to the list of items I no longer need in my life. And now, of course, I have a gas-sucking engine, uh, a cell phone, and I shop at Walmart, but I don't eat beef. <clears throat> Despite that 
at, despite the fact that everyone else I knew, including Terrence McKenna, who had also eaten five grams of dried magic mushrooms, has not gotten this message from the mushroom god, it still makes perfect sense to me. In the eight months or so it took me to disentangle myself from the real estate web I had spun for myself, I busied myself on YouTube and the internet, spending hours upon hours scouring the web for information about the imminent collapse of this planet and the imminent doom of all life, including human life, that we are facing as individuals, as a society, and as a species. The more I took the time to open my fucking eyes and wake up to what is happening on this planet, the more I became convinced that we are in the end times on Earth. The information is out there for anybody who wants to read it, all you have to do is go look it up. It wasn't long before I had morphed from Sam Mitchell Realtor to Hambone Littletail Environmental Alarmist, Doomsday Prophet, and Chronicler of the Collapse of Western Civilization, the title I hold to this day. Suffering the bizarre illusion that somebody out there might actually agree with me that the impending crash of life on Earth was more important than the date and the location of the next party, I lumped all this information together under the umbrella of a Yahoo group. This was before Facebook. I named the Chicken Little Society. If you go on, well, the now defunct laughable homepage of Chicken Little Society, which became Humpty Dumpty Tribe, you will notice that I had pathetic dreams of this little group becoming some sort of raucous debate or some such happy horse shit. In the first three months, my little band of bell ringers actually swelled to 112 members, but after I had split Austin and banished myself to this island of irrelevancy I inhabit to this day, it started to dawn on me that nobody was reading anything I wrote, much less attending to the links to the site, which was the entire reason I created it. My raucous debate collapsed into nothing more than a one-man bastard form of impotent, meaningless blog enjoying the background noise of 10 million other irritating noisemakers jamming people's email boxes and wasting their valuable time with boring prattle about meaningless crap like the collapse of civilization, the sixth mass extinction that we're in the middle of right now, personal responsibility, revolutions in planetary consciousness, and all the rest of that doom and gloomer shit or religious dogma. It's hard to tell the difference sometimes. After a bout of chicken house cleaning in April of this year, meaning in April of 2009, membership in the coop, which was predominantly made up of my best friends and family members just wanting to make sure I was still alive, nothing more, plummeted from 112 to 42, where it remained then, but of course uh, it just died uh, a few months later. After sweeping the coop of dead chickens, I spent a couple of months spitting out the psychic puke of 26, 26 rants from the dark side. The last one of those was cast into cyberspace on May 21st, 2009 with promises to my remaining chickens that was finally getting 
that I was finally getting my ass to the Amazon jungle the next day and that they would be free of my harangues for a minimum of 60 days. Well, that was about 40 days ago. And now, for your reading pleasure, you get to hear the rest of this story. And, uh, anyway, guys, I just need, uh, to do, uh, some ham bone disclaimers in this prep, in this preface, and then I'll get on with the story. I really, I do promise, and you can jump ahead to chapter one and the next video or order the book. Okay. I need a couple of Hambone Little Tail uh, amplifications and clarifications and disclaimers before jumping into this book. <clears throat> that stuff I said earlier about being a former journalist, I want you to pay special note to the word former in that sentence. Former means I used to be a journalist, an essentially, a, an essentially fictional term that implies a couple of attributes that in no way apply to me, at least in my position as author of this tale. It implies that the reporter writer makes at least some attempt to be objective and balanced in his reporting, and it implies that the reporter writer is receiving some form, no matter how pathetic, of financial remuneration for his efforts. Since I can guarantee you that the second attribute does not apply to me, that is just one more reason to throw out any pretense of the first. <clears throat> Besides the obvious fact that I am a self-indulgent narcissist, I have voluntarily elected to throw out all pretense of objectivity and balance. And some people reading this would add accuracy to the list, no doubt. For a couple of reasons, <clears throat> First and foremost, in my newly self-appointed position as environmental alarmist, doomsday prophet, and chronicler of the downfall of Western civilization, my job here is to shove back in the face of the planet eaters exactly what they deserve after decades, if not centuries, of feeding us the shit they've been cramming down our own throats. Frankly, I'm sick and tired of eating their shit, and I'm going to give them a tiny crumb of it back. <clears throat> it's the planet eater's way of abiding by the negative law of attraction. They feed me their bullshit and their lies for 50 fucking years. I'm going to give them some back to them so they can find out what it tastes like. Their shit tastes like shit. Guys, I'm moving on with my life to find something a little sweeter on the palate. Want to join me? That's just a general rule that should pretty much cover whatever I write, regardless of where I am. But since I have made the dubious decision to report the facts to you from the Peruvian Amazon, where, as you'll find, it can take an entire morning to buy a lousy cup of coffee, I need to add an extra layer of ham bone disclaimer before I get into the first word of my Peruvian travelogue. Guys, I cannot make this too clear. A large part of what I am getting ready to relate concerns extremely 
technical details covering everything from tropical ecology, botany, zoology, geology, geography, topography, hydrology, meteorology, anthropology, archaeology, sociology, Latin American politics, world financial markets, the World Bank, the IMF, Chinese ideology, engineering, blah, 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 and how these various components are working with and against each other in the battle for or against, against about 99% of the time, one of the remotest, hardest to get to spots on this planet. Add to this fact that well over 50% of my information that I'm getting from experts is coming to me in Spanish, some spoken, some written communication. That would be fine and dandy if I spoke Spanish, but since I don't and never will, no matter how many years I live in Peru, it will no doubt affect my accuracy rating. If you're one of those detail-oriented, anal-retentive boards who lives to throw babies out with the bathwater, go ahead, throw all 10,000 babies out with this bathwater, dude, because I am making it clear for the record that I did not spend and will not ever spend 20 years of my life chasing down arcane little details of minutiae which I don't understand that would serve no purpose whatsoever except to bore you to tears anyway and would bury the Amazon rainforest so deeply in the dying trees that you'd never be able to see the forest. There is one more little aspect of reporting from the Peruvian Amazon that I must touch upon to offer you the true picture of what I am dealing with. First, I want to state loud and clear for the record that the overwhelming majority of Peruvians, even the cops, that I have met in my first six weeks here have been some of the friendliest, sweetest, most polite, and open-hearted folks I have ever met in my life. That said, I also need to state loud and clear for the record that the overwhelming majority of Peruvians, even the people who make a living off of tourism, are some of the most outrageously inefficient, duplicitous, self-sabotaging, untrustworthy, unreliable flakes I have ever met in 20 years of traveling in Latin America, period. By and large, these smiling, friendly flakes will tell you anything they think you want to hear such as they will meet you at a definite time and place with absolutely zero regard for the facts or the truth or any other such minor detail like that. And I'm not just talking about the Indians here. I am talking about all the folks I have met here. I will accept my share of the responsibility in this mess due to my inability to learn Spanish and my refusal to get a cell phone, both of which have no doubt contributed heavily to my gringo frustration in this maddening level of flakiness. On the other hand, some of the worst examples of flakes I have met in this country are college-educated professionals who are fluent in English. Gringos who have lived here for years all say that this maddening flakiness is the single biggest impediment to leading a normal life in Peru. But hey, it's their country if you don't like it, leave. Now for a note concerning my use of the word Indian. As far as I can term determine, it is not yet politically incorrect 
to refer to Amazon natives who have lived here for millennia as Indians, as it is in the U.S. and Guatemala, for instance. The Indians themselves use the term interchangeably with native, as do the political organizations set up to defend their rights in this country. If it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. If that changes in the future and they come up with some other term they would prefer, I will happily mend my ways. For these various reasons, I have opted not to quote any of my informants by name that provided me with background information, except in rare cases where I will direct you to Google specific articles that I feel clearly articulate the facts that I want to impart to you, I will leave it up to you to do your own background research. And I give a big recommendation to mongabay.com, the single greatest rainforest protection news website ever created. You're not stupid. So, if I'm talking about, say, strangler figs, and you want to find out more about strangler figs, then Google it for Christ's sake, like everybody else, okay? All this is my long-winded way of saying that Peruvian Plunge does not pretend to be any sort of journalistic record complete with a laundry list of footnotes and bibliography of source material to back up my facts concerning all the shit that is flying around the Peruvian Amazon and, by extrapolation, the rest of the planet because as goes the Amazon, so goes the rest of the world. All it claims to be is one person's subjective truth as to what he honestly believes to be the truth after researching the subject exhaustively, interviewing dozens of folks in two languages, seeing it with my own eyes, and perhaps most importantly, running my opinions past Gaia to see if she basically agrees with me. If she does, I will print it. Gaia is the only editor that this reporter answers to. That's all it ever will be because that's all it can be. If there's something in here that strikes a chord in you, then great, I've done my job. And what exactly is my job? What does an environmental alarmist, doomsday prophet, chronicler of the downfall of Western civilization, who believes in his heart that humanity and this planet are doomed to do with himself all day? What exactly am I doing with my life down here in the Peruvian Amazon jungle typing out these desperate words into the universe from this island of irrelevance when I could be getting high with my friends at a picking party in South Austin, Texas. I am taking orders from spirit. That's what I'm doing. I am exercising my personal responsibility as someone who has come into the information that this planet is poised on the brink of destruction to disseminate that information the best way I know how in the desperate hope that someone out there is listening and will join me in this exercise of personal responsibility. I'm fulfilling a promise to my mother that I made in a hot spring in Guatemala and confirmed 100 feet up a kapok tree in Peru that I will do everything in my power, no matter how tiny my voice, to spread the word that our mother is dying in my desperate attempt to find anyone to listen. She is crying out to me, to you, 
to all 7 billion, make that 8 billion of us on this fragile little spaceship. Her message is not about the Amazon jungle. It's not about the weed or the mushrooms. It's not even about the fucking planet eaters. Her message is all about consciousness. It's about the only thing that stands any hope of bringing us back from the brink of destruction we have brought ourselves to. Nothing short of a planet-wide revolution in consciousness that can only begin when each one of us in our own hearts takes some damn personal responsibility for our part in the mess and announces to themselves, to Gaia, and to the universe that we are ready to clean up the mess we have made of things and to step into the new paradigm together. Here is the best way I know to keep that promise to Gaia. I hope you find something in here that speaks to you. Now, without further ado, let us begin Peruvian Plunge, the unfolding story of what happened when a realtor from Texas headed to the Peruvian Amazon to kick Big Oil's ass out of the Mother of God. And uh, I have no idea how long I've been talking to myself, but anyway, this is a test. If you're with me now, go ahead and see if I made it to chapter one. You can always go on lulu.com and get the book yourself. Bye, guys. Don't believe it. Still recording.